10 years ago, there was an idea. An idea to bring together some of Earth's mightiest and most iconic heroes. To see if they could become something more and unite them in an epic saga that would stand the test of time. But it wasn't meant to be. I don't think it's controversial to say the DC Extended Universe didn't go the way anyone wanted. In an attempt to quote-unquote catch up to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the studio kept trying to steer into trends and ultimately steered right into a wall. Oh, the Guardians of the Galaxy made money! Quick, cut Suicide Squad to look like that! Oh, people didn't like Batman vs Superman being super dark? Quick, cut Justice League to be... whatever this was. And now the DCEU has been formally ended by Aquaman 2. Not the most dignified end. But now that it's over, I think the time might be right to go back to the beginning. The first DC Extended Universe project, and arguably the most untainted. The one made before audience reactions began to influence creative decisions. Because I've had a strange emotional journey with Man of Steel. Way back in 2013, when I saw this movie in theaters, I thought it was great. I was also 17 years old and thought Christopher Nolan's name on a movie automatically made it brilliant. But over the next few years, I noticed that this movie became divisive. People either consider it the greatest superhero movie of all time, or a blatant character assassination of Superman. I have listened to so many reviews about this movie over the years, but you know what? This past August, I watched it for the first time since it was in theaters. I really sat down, took this movie apart bit by bit, and I have once again changed my opinion of it. I believe that this is a movie that is good. Sometimes. This is one of the most thoroughly mixed bags of a movie, with some elements that are actually really good, and some elements that are... not as great. And I think it's worth our time to come through and see what made this movie tick. Now, I want to set a ground rule at the beginning here. I want to meet this movie where it is. What does that mean? It means I'm not going to judge this movie based on what I think Superman should be. I know the most popular vision of Superman is basically an adult Boy Scout, the Christopher Reeves-style Superman who saves the world from Lex Luthor's silly antics, the Superman who saves a cat from a tree. And don't get me wrong, I like that image of Superman, but I am going to meet this movie on its own terms. This is going to be a new incarnation of Superman? Okay. I'll let it build what it wants to build. So the movie opens on Krypton, with Kal-El being born to Jor-El and... Superman's mom? I don't know if they actually gave her a name. Your mother, Lara, and I. And my mixed feelings start right away. See all these designs? I like these. They're cool. Very alien. I really like them when I'm able to look at them because the camera cannot calm down. You'll be an outcast. A freak. It never sits still, and it gives me a constant headache when it does this. I warned you, harvesting the core was suicide. It has accelerated the process of implosion. Now, I know I just said I'm not going to hold this movie up to other Superman media, but I do want to point out a choice here that I think is interesting. In many Superman stories, Krypton's destruction is caused often by natural means, a shift in its orbit, or the planet just gets old and decides to die. But in Man of Steel, Krypton's destruction has been caused by the Kryptonians themselves. Our energy reserves were exhausted. What would you have us do, Al? Look to the stars, like our ancestors did. It's not the only Superman story to do this, but making this choice does add an interesting dimension to things. They exploited their own planet and then did nothing about it until it died. This sets the first brick for a really good theme that we'll discuss later. The planet's instability leads to internal strife, and General Zod attempts a coup against the Elder Council. And Zod is being played at a 110% energy by Michael Shannon. I'm not even kidding when I say he's one of my favorite parts of this movie. What have you done? We have had a child, Zod. Krypton's first natural birth in centuries. Heresy! <laughs> That's just... The funniest reaction to finding out someone had sex. And it's further thrown into contrast because many of the other characters are being portrayed as... what I think is supposed to come across as stoic, but it just feels like they're not invested in what's going on. 
Like this moment here, Superman's parents are launching their infant son into the cosmos, away from the dying planet, spasming in civil war to be the last survivor of their species. And they just don't care. They're like, oh, this is a little windy in here. And then Zod goes, rah. <laughs> But honestly, I actually really appreciate Michael Shannon in this role. The movie would be worse if he wasn't so committed to the bit. I will find him! <laughs> I love you, funny screamy man. But okay, enough clowning. Let's seriously look at what this opening has set up. Krypton was destroyed by decadent leadership, mismanagement of resources, short-sightedness, and an unwillingness to explore, paralyzed by violent conflict with rebellious eugenicists. And the mandate given to Kal-El? Make a better world than ours, Kal. Okay, this could be interesting. This could set up a movie where Superman has to not just stop a mass murdering real estate scam, but actually create a better world. This has potential. Now let's see where it goes next. We cut to Superman in the middle of an episode of Deadliest Catch. Is Deadliest Catch still relevant? It's still relevant. Anyway, Superman gets saved by a guy from some falling equipment, and right away this scene sets up more interesting things. He's undercover, basically, choosing to use his powers for good, but using them discreetly. He doesn't seem to have a life, so to say. Whenever he exposes himself, he just disappears and comes up with a new identity. This is intercut with scenes of him growing up, struggling to adjust to life on this alien planet. The way the atmosphere is messing with his biology and how it scares him. And you know, I like this idea. He's not a perfect little model boy. He even pushes back a bit here. And to be fair, this teacher is kind of being an asshole. Like, the whole class is out here staring. Come on, lady. But his mother comes to save the day. Sure, the dialogue's a little weird. The world's too big, Mom. Then make it small. But you know what? I get the sentiment. And this memory is followed with a shot of a mother whale with a calf, completing that little idea. Good job, Zach get a gold star. We also get this scene of Clark being bullied on the bus before it suddenly veers off the edge of the bridge and the ensuing chaos he- uh, hold on are those bubbles running at a lower frame rate in the back? <clears throat> Anyways Clark saves the bus and everyone on it and then there's this infamous moment. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. Now here's the thing. I will actually defend this moment, because it's easy to watch this line and go, what the hell, Paul Kent? But the context of the scene does have more nuance. Paul Kent isn't just saying, oh, screw those other kids. He's worried about what kind of upheaval will result from Clark being discovered. And honestly, can you blame him? We're talking about a planet where people are killed over what color flag gets put on a pole in the town square. The discovery of a super-powered alien child could spark a global crisis, international unrest, and a lot of people could die from that. Are thousands, millions of lives that could potentially be lost, worth more than a few dozen lives that were definitely going to be lost? Maybe. And it's also worth pointing out that Clark doesn't want to be important either. You're the answer to are we alone in the universe? I don't want to be. I like this kind of apprehension in him. He wants to help people, and he feels like the status of greatness being thrust on him is hurting his ability to do good. Again, a lot of really interesting setup is happening in these scenes. Anyways, we cut to Lois Lane. I'm not a fan of the Daily Planet, but those pieces you wrote when you were embedded with the First Division, well, they were pretty impressive. Guys, I know this is a little subtle, but the movie is implying she's a reporter. And Lois really gets a short end of the stick in this movie. The way she's written falls into that trap of a quote-unquote strong female character circa 2013. She can talk smack with the boys, sure. So if we're done measuring dicks, can you have your people show me what you found? And then she proceeds to be merely an extension of Superman's character for the rest of the movie. A thing to be saved or a conduit for information. It's disappointing that in a film that's trying to be more introspective, Lois Lane is written like this. Perry, come on, it's me we're talking about. I'm a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. Then act like it. She's arrived to ask questions about something that's been found in the ice. 
Clark hears about it and arrives as well, realizing it's a Kryptonian ship and making his way inside. Lois follows him and gets attacked by the security system once he starts up the spacecraft. And we get a nice little meet cute. Adorable. He drops her out in the open before zooming off, and Lois wants to put her story out there for the world. But she butts heads with Lawrence Fishburne, who refuses to run her story about confirming extraterrestrial life. The object and its occupant did not originate on Earth. I can't print this, Lois. You might have hallucinated half of it. I mean, to be fair, the guy kind of has a point. You can't just run a story that someone saw aliens without some hard proof. Okay, you shouldn't run that story without some hard proof. I'm not running a story about aliens walking among us. Also, this line here is weird. Because I want my mystery man to know I know the truth. Like, does she think that the alien believes that she won't know that she encountered an alien? I... Uh... Hey, look, another scene I like. Well, okay, there's still a couple things I can poke fun at the scene for. One, I don't think I've mentioned yet that, like his parents, Clark has caught SFS, Stoic Face Syndrome. Buddy, you're finally getting answers for everything in your life. Can you please care? And also this line. If only Lara could have witnessed this. She was so upset. I, well, I, at least I think she was supposed to be upset. That they wouldn't get to see their son. But you know you're going to make this hologram thing? You didn't make one for her? It's not cool, man. Also, this exposition scene is a bit awkward and extraneous. Most of it is stuff we already knew. I don't know, you could have trimmed one or the other out, but it's still at least fairly visual. It's not a deal breaker for me. Anyways, didn't I say I liked this scene? Your mother and I believe Krypton had lost something precious. The element of choice. Of chance. Mmm, oh yeah. We're getting into some interesting thematic stuff now. What if a child dreamed of becoming something other than what society had intended for him or her? The movie switches gears again to being introspective. The pieces are getting pulled together. And this is exciting. I like the idea of this movie taking on a more social element, making Superman an inspiration for changing society for the better. The people of Earth are different from us, it's true. They won't necessarily make the same mistakes we did. Not if you guide them, Carl. Embodied within that hope is the fundamental belief in the potential of every person to be a force for good. And this all culminates in Clark putting on the suit, and for the first time, he flies. And look at that! He smiled! He felt like a real person for a moment! Oh my gosh, the movie's actually good again! Oh no... So Lois Lane manages to track down Superman, which gets his attention. She wants to tell a story, but he explains to her why he keeps himself secret. And now we get another infamous scene, and... This one's going to be harder to defend. This scene is actually a great microcosm of this movie's strengths and weaknesses, along with Snyder's later movies in this franchise and other works in his filmography. This is where we begin to see what I call the gap. The gap between his intention and his execution. I'm now going to give you an objective breakdown of the scene. Pa Kent and Clark are arguing in a car about how he should use his powers. Clark wants to do more with his powers. Pa Kent is again pushing for him to show restraint. Clark says some hurtful things. You're not my dad. You're just some guy who found me in a field. Pa says some hurtful things. We've been making this up as we go along, so maybe, maybe our best isn't good enough anymore. Then the freeway they're on comes to a standstill. They emerge from the car and see a tornado forming in the field nearby. Everyone flees for the overpass. Pa Kent, at first, stays behind to help some neighbors out of their vehicle. Ma Kent reminds Clark that the family dog is in the car. Clark runs into Pa Kent, saying, I'll get him, I'll get him. Pa says, No, no. Get your mom to the overpass. And hands the kid off to Clark. Pa Kent runs back to the line of cars as a tornado bears down on them. He opens the door. The tornado throws a car at him. The tornado car lands on the Kent car and pins him inside, hurting his foot. Pa Kent opens the door so the dog can escape, but he's too injured to get away himself. Clark moves to help, but Pa motions for him to stop. He gives a sad sort of half smile just before the tornado sweeps him away. Now, here's the thing. I can see what the movie is going for. 
Clark's father is so dead set on keeping his anonymity that he sacrifices his own life for it. They had been arguing and didn't get a chance to make amends before this big disaster. Clark resolves to honor his dad's wishes so that he didn't die in vain. I get what they are going for. But this is still a very silly way to execute the idea. I get it. In emergency situations, people aren't always rational. I'm not saying, oh, Pa Kent should have just been totally logical and let Clark go get the dog instead. How stupid, ding. But what we see with the visual language is this almost comedically timed tornado, which by the way, looks straight out of 2004 as the day after tomorrow, bearing down on a man who says, no, my super powered son, I will specifically stop you from saving the family pet so that I can die in the tornado and give you motivation. Yes, it all makes sense on paper, but the story's not being told on paper. Visually, the scene does not strongly convey the idea that they want to tell. Also, as a side note, if there is a tornado, please do not do this. Overpasses become wind tunnels when a tornado hits them. Do not hide in them. <sighs> Anyways, this is followed by a scene I like again. When you were a baby, I used to lay by your crib at night, listening to you breathe. It was hard for you. You struggled. And I worried all the time. Yeah, I like this interaction here. They're even talking like people. I know I've had some gripes about this movie, but so far I'm actually kind of liking it. I think it could really be... Oh, no. My name is General Zod. I mean, it looks cool and it's very visually impactful, but this scene is going to be a turning point now. A lot of the stuff that the movie has been building up, these thoughtful concepts and questions, a lot of them are about to be dropped. Zod demands that Earth turn over the alien living among them, which is how people discover that Superman's even there. Lois gets targeted by the government because she leaked her story about Superman online, and they know she knows who he is. Superman goes to church and... If there's a chance, I can save Earth by turning myself in. Shouldn't I take it? <sighs> yeah, I gotta talk about this. If you look closely, there's very subtle imagery that suggests Superman is Jesus. But it goes deeper than just this imagery. We have different lines that make the parallel even more explicit. He saw what Clark did. I'm sure what he thought he saw was... was an act of God, Jonathan. Jesus is considered to be both fully human and fully divine. You're as much a child of Earth now as you are of Krypton. But somewhere out there, you... You have another father, too, who gave you another name. Jesus handed himself over willingly for his crucifixion. Why are you surrendering to Zod? I'm surrendering to mankind. There's a difference. There's also the general arc of Superman who is killed in Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, complete with this blocking an imagery that mirrors Jesus being taken down from the cross, as well as an actual cross in the background. Why am I talking about this in a movie titled Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice? Anyways, Justice League then has Superman resurrected and he saves the world, so on and so forth. You get the picture. Superman is Jesus. Except... Well, you know what? Let me just put a pin in these ideas. We'll put them on the Jesus board and we'll come back to it a bit later. Like I just mentioned, Superman gives himself up and the humans surrender him to the Kryptonians. And Lois is also there. Thank you. For what? For believing in me. What is he talking about? Also, why is this presented as like a romantic thing? They had three scenes together, and the first one was him cauterizing her. The movie's making less and less sense by the second. But it's a good thing Lois is here because the Kryptonians demand she come with them. I also find it really funny the way this guy almost sparks an interstellar war to be a hero. Shall I tell the general you're unwilling to comply? I don't care what you tell him. Anyways, they go up to the ship and while they're on the way, Superman slips Lois his key. But he didn't know she was going to be with him? What's your plan here, buddy? What are you doing? Lois is thrown in the broom closet after they probe her mind, conveniently right where she needs to be to use the key. She meets Jor-El's projection and he tells her, Remember, the phantom drives are essential in stopping them. Now I will say, this sequence where Jor-El is leading her through the hallways is actually pretty fun. Here's Zach, another gold star for that. 
Meanwhile, Superman learns more about the Codex and how it contains the genetic information of all future Kryptonian citizens. He also learns more about Zod's plan and what it would mean for Krypton to actually live again. The Foundation has to be built on something. Even your father recognized that. Jesus fucking Christ. From Lois's mind, they discover Clark's secret identity and go to confront his mother to find the Codex. <laughs> Sorry, that's just so extra. It's kind of funny. Superman intervenes and a horrible fight breaks out right in the middle of Smallville. Oh god, not the 7-Eleven! Not the Sears! Oh, there's a vanity! Oh, anything but the IHOP! Oh, how? Oh, hey, it's Peter Ross. Actually, let me take a detour real quickly as all this punching is going on to gush about Peter Ross. Peter Ross's character arc goes like this. In middle school, we see him in the bus bullying Clark. Hey, asswipe! But then when Clark saves the bus, his parents confront the Kents about it, and we can see he's kind of shaken. Later on, when Clark is being bullied again, we actually see Peter help him out. Look at that! Character growth! And then later on, when Lois Lane is working on tracking down Superman, he's seen working at the IHOP. How lovely that he's become a part of this prestigious international institution. And he's even seen one movie later at Clark's funeral. This is truly an exemplar of the positive inspiration that Superman was meant to have on the human race. Thank you, Peter Ross, for showing us this potent and moving redemption arc. I'm only half kidding, by the way. This is actually one of the most complete character arcs in the entire DC Extended Universe. Anyways, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. I will point out that Superman does tell people to get to safety. Get inside. It's not safe. And he does act to try and save the humans who are also in this battle. But this scene goes on for too long. Hey, remember when this movie was about inspiring hope? Anyways, he wins out and the humans begin to accept that he's friendly. This man is not our enemy. Back on their ship, though, Zod and his crew realize that the Codex has been actually encrypted into Superman's cells. <laughs> and, and, and encrypted. Get it? Because he's from- So they decide to start terraforming the planet for Kryptonians. <laughs> Christ! You can see people being yanked into the air before they splatter on the ground. This is bleak. But don't worry, they have a plan. Jor-El had told Lois that crashing Superman's escape pod against the world engine will destroy it. Which is a lot of information to get from... The Phantom Drives are essential in stopping them. Anyway, so they split up to do the mission and we get more... <laughs> Hey, remember when this movie was talking about the right to choose your destiny and how the mistakes of the past could be avoided? Now here's where another common criticism of the movie arises. The idea that Superman doesn't save the city here. And again, this is where the gap comes into play. The terraforming process is controlled by this ship here and this tripod thing here. Both are working in tandem. The ship over the city cannot be targeted because of these gravity waves. Therefore, defeating this gray goose spreading thing here is the only way to stop the beam and save the city. So Superman does in fact save the city, but, but the movie's not off the hook because we don't see the visual of him saving the city. And that's where I think this criticism still holds water. Logically, yes, Superman saves the city, but emotionally, he didn't. Which is a weird way to phrase that, but let me explain. Movies are a visual medium. I know, only the most shocking revelations on this channel. There's more to telling a cinematic story than just the script. You have to find compelling visual ways to communicate that story to the audience. Look at one of the most iconic movie moments of all time. Boom, Death Star explosion. Now, even ignoring the context of the rest of the franchise, you can logically say, but wait a minute, the Empire's not fully defeated. But visually, yes, they are. 
Big, scary, evil space station go kablooey. They're gone. They're done. They're bye-bye. Other DC movies have nailed this. Robert Pattinson's Batman is there taking down the Riddler's followers, and then he personally helps to lead a crowd to safety. Batman is visually saving people. Good use of visual language. Snyder's even managed to nail this himself in his other work. I'm not a particularly big fan of 300, for reasons I'm planning to articulate later on, but it uses visual language in an effective way. Leonidas managing to land this long shot blow against Xerxes is a great humbling moment. Granted, lifted directly from the graphic novel, but whatever, I'll count it. Our eyes don't see Superman saving the city. Our eyes see Superman fighting a cloud of metal putty that we're told will result in saving the city. And the gulf of that disconnect can be seen in how many people misunderstand this scene. Not because they're stupid idiots who aren't big brain enough to understand a fucking Superman movie, but because the film is not making strong use of the cinematic medium. Anyways, after the world engine has been stopped, Superman finally flies back to Metropolis, where Zod is flying the baby garden thing that they need to repopulate Kryptonians. If you destroy this ship, you destroy Krypton! Krypton had its chance! Mm, yeah, I'm gonna pin that to the Jesus board too. We're gonna get back to that. Anyways, the ship crashes into the other ship, and then they go shlorp, and Superman saves Lois, returning to the ground with her safely. And then their wonderful chemistry climaxes with a kiss. You know they say it's all downhill after the first kiss. Uh, Lois, people are fucking dead! The dust hasn't even settled at ground zero, can we, like, uh, not? But uh-oh, Zod is still alive. And again, this contrast is really funny to me. Michael Shannon is giving this committed performance. And every action I take, no matter how violent or how cruel, is for the greater good of my people. And then Superman just visibly doesn't give a shit. Come on, Clark, I know you're a weird alien, but give me at least some indication that you were raised by humans. God, it's so weird. Henry Cavill honestly acts more like Superman when he's not in one of these movies. Can I just say it? Henry Cavill can destroy me, like legit. He can Superman this hoe. That's very kind of you. I appreciate your vigor, but um, don't hurt yourself. Be careful out there. So we get another fight scene. Okay, I remember when this movie was about space Jesus. Though, I'll defend the movie on a couple counts here. First of all, kind of small, but I like this part where Zod's about to hit Superman with a steel beam, and Superman uses his laser eyes to melt it just before it impacts him. That's a cool use of his powers. Have a third gold star, Zack. Second, again, Superman isn't trying to destroy the city. He does grind Zod's face along a building here, so he's not totally innocent, but for the most part, he's not the one causing this mayhem. Zod is. I've seen some folks say that Superman should have tried to fight Zod outside the city, but that wouldn't have worked because Zod isn't after him. I'm going to make them suffer, Cal. These humans you've adopted. I will take them all from you one by one. If Superman tries to do something like, Zod, if you want me, you have to come get me out in space. Zod would just go, okay. And that leads me into my third point, this. Yeah. I will actually defend this. Zod made it very clear that he was not going to be swayed from his rampage. There's only one way this ends, Cal. Either you die, or I do. Stop! Never. So in this moment, Clark kills him out of desperation. And we can see that he immediately feels horrific about it. Perhaps he realizes that he is now the last of his kind, and the horror of that has reached him. Or perhaps he's so rent with guilt over what he's done, that he resolves to never, ever take another life again, no matter how foul they- it... Hey, why did the movie cut away? What, where are we? What's going- Holy shit, what the hell? I'm here to help. But it has to be on my own terms. 
uh, Zach, we were having a moment. This really dramatic and powerful moment that's supposed to be Superman at his breaking point doesn't receive the gravity it needs to work. Again, a gap between what the movie itself wants to be and what we get. <sighs> Taken away one of your gold stars. And on that note, let's finally return to the Jesus board one last time. We have all these references indicating that Superman is Jesus, because Jesus saved the world. Except, there's more to the biblical story than just Jesus saved the world. In the Christian tradition, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. He was sent to earth as a sacrifice. He was sent to earth specifically to die. He did not resist when he was arrested or when he was executed. In other words, Jesus did not do this. You think you could threaten my mother? The only story of Jesus getting physically forceful was when he drove money changers from the temple. He was morally offended by the idea of such frivolous commerce taking place on holy ground. But he did not start fist-fighting Pontius Pilate. He did not use his Jesus powers to start throwing demons through the ancient Roman IHOP. Superman is Jesus. So what? The symbolism is so, so blatant and yet demonstrates little understanding about what such a statement would even mean. Superman and Man of Steel doesn't demonstrate any of the qualities that the Christian gospel extols. And even if he's not directly responsible, he's still at the center of apocalyptic violence. And Jesus was not. The movie draws this comparison and then what's communicated? That Superman is a good guy? That Jesus was a good guy? Wow, I'm shocked! All of the stuff on the Jesus board that we've been collecting, it's all a hollow use of symbolism. It's all in service of a visual metaphor that ultimately means next to nothing. The channel Pillar of Garbage, contrary to its name, has an excellent video essay about the problems with this comparison, and I'll link that at the end of the video if you want to hear more about it. But yeah, the ultimate fatal flaw with Man of Steel is that so much of what it promises to deliver just doesn't come together. Maybe the later movies delivered on those promises? I'm your best friend. Besides, who's gonna give you a reach around? <sighs> yeah, no, not really. That's the reason why, despite the strengths of this movie, and it does have strengths, I can't bring myself to say I liked it. It's a film with ambitions of being and saying something profound, but it falls short. The ideas it entertains are abandoned in favor of flashy action scenes, and its story beats aren't supported by its own visual language. And again, bear in mind at no point in this review have I said anything about what I think Superman is supposed to be. I've done my best to accept that this is the Superman that Man of Steel wanted to create, and by its own standards, he still falls short. This is a movie that I feel is both overhated and overrated. It's a film with both genuine merits and deep-rooted faults. It's just so, so close to actually being good, but it doesn't hit the mark. So all in all, one of the best movies of the DCEU. Nice job, Zach. Okay, bye!